What is the Feast of the Booths? And why wouldn't Jesus go into Judea? That's what we're going to talk about today. John 7 starts out with Jesus being in Galilee and how he was not going to go into Judea because he was being sought out to be killed. This was at the time of what was called the Feast of the Booths. We called it, when I was in Saturday school, it was also called the Feast of the Tabernacles. Before Solomon's temple was built, there was a portable tabernacle, and this was to celebrate that time before the temple. They talk about it in Deuteronomy 16, before the temple was built. And so then you would have this time to get together and celebrate when Joshua was in charge of the people of Israel. One of the reasons that I liked it so much when I was a kid is that we built these temporary buildings outside of the temple, and then we would sleep overnight in these temporary buildings. So to me, this is like camping, and anytime I get a chance to camp, I like that. But in this case, he sends his disciples to go and worship in Jerusalem to be a part of this celebration or this feast time. But Jesus is saying, you know, you go and so that your disciples can see what it is you're doing. But it said that even his brothers didn't believe him, which is disappointing. But he says, my time hasn't come. Your time is always here. The world can't hate you. They hate me. I think a lot of times the reason that many people hate Christians, maybe it's something we're doing, But just the world's rejection of Christianity has to do with actually the rejection of Jesus himself and not personally us. So go ahead and feast tonight. I'll stay there. So Jesus stays in Galilee and his brothers, it says, goes up to the feast in private. And when people were looking for him, they were, where is it? Where is Jesus? And other people were saying, no, 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 he's a good person. So there were mixed feelings about it. But even Even the people themselves were afraid to talk about it because there were so many plots and anger against Jesus. It says, in the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. And people were amazed, marveled, it said, at what he was saying. It's interesting because they are all questioning the fact that he never went to rabbi school. (laughs) You know, he never had the formal training of being a rabbi. How does he know all these things? Of course, we know he knows all these things. Son of God, he's going to know all those things, which means to me his answers must be pretty good because if they were stupid answers or they were completely off track, they would, ah, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Instead, they're like, where did he get this training? Means it's pretty good. The thing that also always got me about the temple structure is they accused him of witchcraft or blaspheming, but they didn't argue with him. Well, according to Rabbi so-and-so, this point here is completely wrong. It was no debate. And again, that question, whose authority is he teaching with? And Jesus says, honestly, the teaching is not mine. If anyone does the will of God, he knows the teaching is from God. And Moses gave you the law, but you're not keeping the law. You all agree on the law. The the Sadducees and the Pharisees all agree the law is important. You're not even following that. And it said the crowd called him a demon, wanted to kill him and questioned to Jesus asking, why do you want to kill me? Who is trying to kill you? You know, they're denying it. This plot is going on to kill Jesus without being so public, yet they deny it and saying, well, you know, no one's killing you. Who's trying to kill you? You know, you're, you're crazy. You're not accurate. And he talks about how he did one work and it says you marveled at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but from, so when Jesus says, you saw me do this miracle, and you were amazed. He's talking about the healing at the pool of Bethesda, which he did on Sabbath, and accused him of breaking the laws of Sabbath. You're saying that Moses gave you this rule of circumcision, but you know what? Who did it first? Abraham. Abraham was given the rule, and it was also included in Moses. So you're not even accurate about where this particular rule or law of circumcision is coming. It's calling into question not just their knowledge but they're following the laws of God or just getting it wrong. Of course, Moses was the most important part and saying, you know, you're angry with me because I did a healing on Sabbath. I made someone well by that. You shouldn't be judging 
based on what you think is supposed to happen, but instead, what is the right judgment? Despite the people saying, no one's trying to kill you, Jesus, the people knew he's trying to kill him. Why is he trying to kill him? Because he speaks openly and they can't even reply to what he is saying. They can't deny it because Jesus knows that he's right. Jesus goes to the temple again and says, you know me, you know where I come from. I don't come here because of me. I come here because of my father. He's the one who sent me to come here. But they couldn't lay a hand on him. Time hasn't come right. This redemptive action on the part of Jesus has a schedule. Time is not yet. People, it said, believed him and wondered if even more signs were going to happen. The Pharisees sent out officers to arrest Jesus. And Jesus says, I will be with you a little bit longer. And then I'm going to he who sent me. I'm going back to the Father. You're going to look for me. You won't find me. I am where you cannot come. And they're puzzled by this too. Where's he going to go that we can't go? We can go anywhere we want to go. You'll seek for me and you won't be able to find me. And on the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up. Anyone thirsts, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of the heart will flow the river of living water. There we go. Talked about that at the well of Cana, the living water. Then we talked about the bread of life. Come to me, he sang, and go get these things. We talked last time about whether or not maybe this is a reflection of the future of communion. But really what this is, is talking about giving people the nourishment to believe in them, to strengthen faith. Come to me and be nourished. And John adds in, this is going to be the spirit for whoever believes in him is going to get the spirit, but hasn't come quite yet because Jesus has not yet been glorified. When they heard these words, people again were just curious. Is he a prophet? Is he the Messiah? Christ means Messiah. He comes from Galilee. The scripture says that whoever is going to be the Messiah is going to be in the family of David, coming from Bethlehem, where David was. And so it caused disputes. It said there was fights about whether or not this was the Messiah. Obviously, everything that God predicted would happen in the prophets is coming to life right now. They can't see clear enough to get a clear point in this debate. But no one's ever talked like him. And then other people say, no, you're deceived. This is not who it's supposed to be. And even Nicodemus at this point stands up for him and says, we can't judge a man without hearing him out. And they say, oh, well, you know, you're from Galilee, too. There's no prophets in Galilee. Like I said, I come from the North Woods. No, nothing good is up there. There is nothing good happening up there. So. They start, I think, pointing their figures at Nicodemus, too. I mean, you know, it's one of those things where it's bad enough when you disagree with some. It's fine to debate back and forth. But when you try to shut down conversations by saying, well, maybe you're one of them, too. You're from that same area. You know that no prophets come from Galilee, the backwoods. So this got suddenly very scary. Nicodemus as well, probably. And as a side note, John 7.53 to John 8.6 was not included in the earliest manuscripts of John. So whether or not it was a part of that or not a part of that, that's up for debate. We'll talk about the first part of John 8 next time. What I'm going to meditate this week is about how Jesus has that consistent message of being our nourishment. He even put himself in danger to go into Jerusalem to say this message in the temple area. As you can see, it caused fights, debates, and people trying to shut down each other harshly. What I'm going to pray about is that we always listen to God's word, that we always come to him for that nourishment, but we never try to shut down things we don't like that God has said because they go outside what we believe is true or want to be true. That's very typical. We think it's our way. We think that we know the way. They, when they were hearing about the rivers of living water, the bread of life, they were thinking about physical things. They were thinking about Moses getting manna. They were thinking about 
not the spiritual things of God. I pray that I'm always able to focus on that spiritual aspect of God. And what I'm going to share with others is the fact that Christ does bring division. We can see it at the very time of Christ talking to the chief priests, the Pharisees, and even Nicodemus, who was a high-standing member of the Sanhedrin. It wasn't that they were just fighting against Jesus. The people were fighting against each other. The chief priests and the rabbis were fighting with the people. And now they're making accusations towards Nicodemus. When the word of God comes through, as Jesus said, they don't hate you, they hate me. When Christians are living a Christ-like life, you, and you can see that, there are people who just hate Christians. Sometimes, again, someone did something and there are some reasons for it. There are other times where people don't have necessarily a single complaint against anyone. They just know they don't like Christians. They don't like the message of Christ. They don't like Jesus. They don't like the idea of it. I heard a certain atheist talking about how he hopes Jesus isn't true because he doesn't want a God. He doesn't want Jesus to be accurate. This world hates him and always has, even from the very beginning. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always email me at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to be able to pray for you. And I hope you're praying for me too. Thanks so much and have a great week.